But the uniqueness of this war is that unlike any other war, and you, look, you can look at the worst cases, like Hitler attacking Poland, or uh, Saddam Hussein annexing Kuwait, I'm not here to defend this, this barbaric acts of aggression, but they all made diplomatic preparations. Hitler talked about dancing corridor, uh, obviously about Sudetland. Saddam Hussein talked about British imperialism uh, taking part of, of sovereign Iraqi territory. The uniqueness of this war that not a single Russian government since 1991, and we're talking about Boris Yeltsin, uh, Putin, then you remember the name Medvedev? This, 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 this man that, you know, uh, just uh, sitting in the middle, you know, just warming chair for Putin. Uh, then Putin again for a year. Every Russian parliament never, never made a single call for return of so-called Russian, historic Russian territories. So the annexation of Crimea happened just overnight with zero diplomatic preparation, which makes, I think, it's absolutely unique. When you look at the war today, and uh, it, it's most of the, or most of the action uh, is happening in eastern Ukraine. Most of people who live there, they are many of the ethnic Russians. Most of them speak Russian. So we can even call it civil war because it's, you know, both sides, you know, they, 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 they speak the same, the same tongue. And many of them were born, you know, just on the other side of the illusionary border. Uh, for instance, Kharkiv or Belgorod, 100 miles difference. Same language, read same newspapers. So uh, uh, what, was, what was the difference? Why, you know, why the Ukrainians, and that's Putin's biggest miscalculation, why Ukrainians or Russian Ukrainians leading, leaving the other side of the border defending their country and not showing any willingness to, to, to uh, be subdued by Putin? And I think probably it goes all the way back to 1994 because democracy, as we found out, is not just, you know, oh, elections. The key you know, element of success of any democracy is a peaceful transit of power. And that's what separated Russia and Ukraine back in 1994. In 1994, Leonid Kravchuk, the first Ukrainian president, lost elections to Leonid Kuchma and walked away. In 1994, Yeltsin regime started war in Chechnya to find a good reason for Yeltsin to stay in power. So I think that's already created a very different um, mindset for Russians and, 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 and Ukrainians. Because ever since 1994, Ukrainians did not want anyone to impose their will on them. You know, I've been shouting about this war being imminent for many, many years, for a simple reason. I listened to Putin. I didn't, I didn't have a, a crystal ball. I didn't pretend to be Nostradamus. I just listened to Putin. And he was very specific. First, you know, in general, it's not me. Putin kept saying the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Is it clear? Oh, he didn't have the same, um, the sa the, the same um, powers when he said it first time. But it was very clear that he had it already in his mind. In 2007, in, in, uh, in Munich, at the security conference, looking in the eye, into the eyes of the leaders of the free world, Vladimir Putin bluntly said, go back to 1997 borders, NATO. And he made it very clear next year in, in, Buc in Bucharest, uh, so at, at, at the summit, on NATO summit, that he would not tolerate, you know, Ukraine and Republic of Georgia, so being admitted to, 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 to the organization. And it's, he didn't just say that. He backed his words with action, attacking Republic of Georgia. And by the way, European Union was very busy trying to, to, to spread the blame. It's, I should probably remind people about Talelini Commission that spent weeks and months trying to find a reason to blame Saakashvili, you know, not to have a full blame on Putin. And then, you know, just step by step, you know, he just moved on and, uh, and just tested the water. And, uh, and 2014 was just, you know, it's a great opportunity the way he saw it. And what's happened after, sanction, after annexation of Crimea? The answer is nothing. Something that was called sanctions by Obama, President Obama or European leaders, it was like a mosquito bite. When people say Putin, whether Putin was crazy or Putin you know, made a mistake, the answer is, no, he was not crazy. He was very logical in, in his you know, world. All he knew is that the free world offered no opposition to his acts. So why did he, why, why we thought he had to expect the, the something else? Oh, his only mistake was that every dictator made before him is he underestimated the will of free people and their willingness uh, to die 
for, for, for the motherland uh, and, and for, for freedom. And uh, the, when they failed taking over Kiev in three or four days, as he planned, so the war changed in its face. But it's, uh, again, for eight years since the annexation of Crimea, Russian propaganda kept talking about war on Ukraine as something that's almost fait accompli. It, would, it was a matter of time when we re retake back our, our lands. Ukraine state is not a real one. The interesting thing is that they always change the reason. You know, it's, it's not just, oh, it's NATO to come too close. This is the, the flying time for NATO missiles. Yes, but Estonia was a member, member of, of NATO from 2004, and the distance from Estonia to St. Petersburg is much closer than from Kiev to Moscow. So then they changed the reason again. But, but what was important is they always, you know, pushed one idea for eight years. And again, I've been listening to their propaganda. And they were very consistent. The war would come. This, is, this, this war is very much, you know, has deep imperial roots, but also it's the, it's the attempt to take revenge uh, on, on, the, on the loss of the, of the Cold War. And uh, I always call Putin an existential threat for, uh, for our values, for, for our civilization, for a simple reason. He does not want to live in a world, as, as Prime Minister said you know, very eloquently, in the world where you know, our values are dominant. He doesn't live in a world with consensus, compromise. It's about, you know, I'm the law. So that's why his favorite historical um, analogs Joseph Stalin and Ivan the Terrible, not even Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, because they could impose their will and be above the law. So I think the war was imminent, and uh, it's now, while discussing the, the roots, we should also you know, find a way to make sure that this war will be the last war of Russian Empire. Thank you. Now, speaking about Russian public, uh, I think it's the, we could be as objective as identifying the, the mood in Russia as you could be objective in Nazi Germany in 1940. The answer is, I don't know. It's on the surface. They, they, today, they said Putin's support is 79%. Do I trust these numbers? No. Do I know whether it's how f close it's to reality? I don't know. We can say that the significant portion of the Russian population, whether it's a majority or not, supports Putin and the war for a simple reason they don't know better. I mean, let's not forget, you know, it's the most of Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine. They were even born when Putin became president, so this is in power for 22 years, or they went to school, yes, when he was. So they don't know anything else, it's Putin. So even in 1944, 1945, you know, the many Germans still, you know, believed in Führer, and he was in power for less than 12 years. Putin's in power for more than 20 years. So I think it had tremendous negative impact on the minds of so many Russians. Also, as, as Andrew pointed out, Putin avoids dragging Moscow and, and St. Petersburg or other big cities like Yekaterinburg into the war. You have almost, almost no impact, no body bags. Yes, the, the price is going up, you know, the economy is not working. So this, but again, this is not the same as, as, as receiving body bags. So he's, he um, drags recruits from either from national republics like Chechnya, Dagestan, uh, Buryatia, Tuva, I think uh, Buryatia and Tuva have the highest uh, percentage of, of, of uh, casualties in, in, in Ukraine, or from very poor, desolated uh, Russian countryside, and, and offers a lot of money. So 12 million rubles for, for, for a dead man in, 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 in the places where the average pension is 15,000 rubles. So it's, it's, it could, it's, very, it's very attractive, and three million for, 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 for wounded. So it's, whether they pay it or not, that's another story, but that's, that's what they are, they, they're using these this, uh, this arguments. And uh, Russian television dominates the space, so the all opposition outlets being destroyed completely. So, um, but at the same time, we had the biggest exodus of Russian intellectuals since 1917. Never happened, you know, after February 24th. So we have a massive, massive exodus. So it's what you start looking at the top Russian writers, painters, you know, the culture. It's their, their other side. So this is, and again, Putin doesn't need intellect. It's, it's, it's all about war. And um, as long as he can keep this, the, the illusion that he is winning, he, I think, can control the situation. I think this is something to, to remember. I think it's very much psychology of the, of, of the Russians. They can bear sacrifices if they believe they're winning. But they will never forgive the government for losing. 
So that's, that's the key. Every loss of the war, whether it's Crimean War in the middle of the 19th century, whether it's a Russo-Japanese War, whether it's the, the um, World War I, the moment they thought that the government was you know, just losing, it, it led to dramatic political changes. So that's why it's important for Putin to keep this, this, this picture. And you know, what can change it? The news from the front line. I still, it's this for those who think, oh, what are the chances of coup d'etat? a palace coup in Russia. None. It's this only when Putin is weak. Dictator is never attacked by his cronies if he looks strong. The only n public attempt on Hitler's life was July 20th, 1944, when the, all the generals already knew the war was lost because of Normandy landing was successful. And still, majority of the army s stayed, st stayed with the Fuhrer. So only the news from, from front line, from Donbass, or attack, successful attack on, on, Sevastopol, on Sevastopol, like you know, attacking the fleet, or attack on Crimean Bridge. Something that will show to Russia's way that war is going in the wrong, wrong direction. And combination of these factors, plus sanctions, then they'll start thinking, putting things together, one, one on one. Sanctions, wars, wars, it's not lost, but we're on the wrong side now, maybe we're losing. So then we can expect, we can expect uh, changes. To make it short, I would use just this one term. Ruski Mir. This is the key term. It needs to be translated because it's, it has double meaning. Ruski Mir means, of course, Russian world, but at the same time, Russian peace, Pax Rossica. And in these two dimensions, this term describes not only hatred towards Ukrainians, but also contempt towards the West. These two elements are the key uh, elements of uh, understanding Putin's politics. Uh, the first one, uh, hatred towards Ukrainians, is uh, connected with the concept of Ruski Mir as Russian world. Putin uh, several times reused an old Tsarist imperial term of Russian triune nation, meaning, of course, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. Uh, but all the three as branches of one great Russian nation. And he uses these phrases on many important uh, occasions. So I absolutely agree with uh, Gary Kasparov. You need to read Putin and to listen to Putin if you want to understand what he will do, not only what he is doing, but what he will do. Everything is written there. Uh, he uh, identified the problem with Ukraine already in 2008, right after Munich conference, which was mentioned by um, Mr. Gary Kasparov. Already in February 2008, Putin stated that uh, Ukraine is not even a state. This is a, a, an exact quotation from Putin. And that modern Ukraine was created by Russia. Uh, both these phrases would be reused several times after 2008. But what is also interesting is the fact that at the same moment, February 2008, Vladimir Putin, uh, just ending his second term as president and hosting the last visitor from the West, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk, offered him a partition of Ukraine. Uh, which was revealed six years later by Foreign Minister of Poland, Radosław Sikorski. Um, so that meant uh, exactly both uh, meanings uh, that, that alluded to both meanings of the concept of Ruski Mir. Ukraine becomes a problem because it doesn't want to be uh, an element of three un Russian nations. So it could be divided and if we find partners for this division, then we can uh, confirm our contempt to these partners, to Western partners. Uh, that was, of course, uh, only a trick, uh, I would say, to divide uh, Poland and Ukraine, to use maybe any commentary uh, given by Polish Prime Minister. Fortunately, he did not give any. Uh, but the concept of dividing what you can swallow altogether is an important element in Russian politics, dividing with Western partners. Beginning with Poland, then Poland could be divided with another partner from the West, and so on and so forth. His goal, I believe, in this war 
is to uh, reunite, uh, according to his logic, uh, as much Ukraine as he can. He understands that he's, he is not capable of taking all of them. So he dehumanizes them, treating uh, those who defend their uh, homes, their families, as fascists. At the same time, Putin simply needs people, needs manpower. He is in dire straits in this regards. When you, when you discuss military aspects, of course, I'm no specialist. There are so many wonderful specialists here. But it seems to me the vital problem of Putin. He does not have young people to send to army. Of course, there, is, there are huge reserves in Moscow, in Leningrad, but uh, I mean, of course, uh, Petersburg, but I'm using uh, Putin's phrase. Um, uh, but he doesn't want to use them, and he wants more uh, young people from territories that should be reunited, meaning this old concept of Ruski Mir, that Belarusians and Ukrainians are also good for the Russian army. Russian army, which would be necessary for further conquests, for further military confrontations, not just with the West, which is obvious, but also with uh, Central Asiatic rivals, and maybe someday with China, when you have 11 times smaller population than Chinese, and you have a long border with China, even though you pretend you are a great friend of China, you consider this imparity and you try desperately to find people. That's why Putin is doing such a barbaric, uh, is using such a barbaric, ancient, I would say, uh, method of capturing people. Hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are being transferred from occupied territories inside Russia. And this is rational. This is not absurd. This is not only to terrorize the rest of Ukrainians. It is also to procure reserves in the near future, maybe not in this war, but in the next war. But let me concentrate towards the end uh, on this second aspect of Ruskimir. It is based on the concept of the West as weak, corrupted, disunited, that should be even further corrupted with this vision of uh, presumed partnership with Russia, which is always connected with humiliation. That's the way how, how Putin, for example, presents his meetings with President Macron, in order to humiliate his patron. That's why he creates this distance, then leaks uh, exactly some elements of this talk, in order to say, it is you that want to talk with me on my conditions, not on yours. And uh, that's how he wants first to divide Western Europe from Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe is concerned, of course, with the scenario of the next war, of the next dismemberment of Ukraine after this one would be accepted somehow by uh, Western partners. And after dividing Eastern Europe from Western Europe, the next goal or parallel goal is to divide fully Western Europe from uh, the US. This is very simple. This is uh, nothing mysterious in that. And uh, this war helps Putin, at least I believe he, uh, he is sure that it will help him to make these two breaches even deeper. At this particular moment when we meet, it seems that his strategy fails because the West is united as it had never been for the last at least three decades. But what will happen after several months of, uh, I would say, fatigue and uh, a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, disenchantment uh, of that uh, original enthusiasm towards Ukraine? Our gas prices are going high, Ukraines cannot win, so maybe, maybe, why should we bother with Ukraine? Our prices are more important. We are responsible before our uh, constituency, uh, which is French, German, Italian, or whatever else, uh, or American. So maybe we should talk, if not with Putin, maybe with someone else, but somehow we, we have to make a deal. And this is exactly what would separate Eastern Europe from Western Europe. And then there is always this temptation, Western Europe 
should be independent from America, should regain its, uh, its full independence, and only Russia can help uh, Western Europe to do this. So this is the concept of Ruski Mir as Pax Rosika. Uh, to use the last phrase, I would say that insecurity as a method of racket, as a method of extortion, further and further conquest by Russia. This is the simplest, uh, maybe too simple, understanding of what is going on uh, now in Ukraine. Thank you. But honestly, can we just stop pretending that the Putin's war against Ukraine is about NATO enlargement? Don't take my word for it. Listen to Vladimir Putin, for God's sakes. He has told us what it's about. Oh, sure, it's about Ukrainian fascists, so-called, which, as Andrzej Novak pointed out, is any Ukrainian who doesn't accept the fact that he's really a Russian. If you don't accept that you're a Russian, you're a fascist. That's one reason. Another reason is also given by Putin himself, this is about Russia's recapturing lands that rightfully belong to it. Putin gave a big speech on the 350th anniversary of Peter the Great's birth. And you can do Peter the Great a lot of ways. Westernizer, reformer, authoritarian modernizer. But no, no, Putin doesn't take any of those ways. What he talks about is Peter the Great, empire builder. He took land from the Swedes. That wasn't Swedish land at all. It was our land. It was always our land. NATO enlargement, the purpose of NATO enlargement was to help create a united Europe, a united Europe after the end of the Cold War. Those of us who were thinking about NATO enlargement actually, and you may laugh, referred to the Atlantic Charter of Roosevelt and Churchill and compared it favorably to Yalta and said, we want to end Yalta Europe, we want to go back to the Atlantic Charter, and that means the security underpinnings of an enlarged EU. It wasn't NATO versus the EU, it was NATO enlargement to provide the conditions for EU enlargement by erasing the mental line in everybody's head that somehow the line of Yalta, the line of the Cold War, had to be the, a permanent line in Europe, which is way, the way most of, most of the West started out in 1989. Poland may be free, but it really isn't part of us. And if, if that sounds weird, trust me, that's where most of the US foreign policy and European foreign policy establishments were. It took a lot of effort to erase that line, and the argument for NATO enlargement is, for God's sakes, we didn't fight World War II to liberate part of Europe up to the line that Stalin drew in 1945 where his armies ended. We did not want to isolate Russia, but we did not want to buy Russia's cooperation by giving them the 100 million Europeans between the Baltic and the Black Sea as a consolation plot prize for losing their empire. I mean, really? Are the Poles and the Lithuanians and the Bulgarians not Europeans? And if not, what are they? Property of Russia to be reclaimed when Russia is strong enough? I mean, what are the implications of not enlarging NATO? The implications of not enlarging NATO is we accept a Russian sphere of domination. Now, there are those who make that argument even today. Ukraine properly belongs to Russia, so give it up. And by the way, it's all hopeless anyway. Oh, the argument, the argument, in fact, some of the same people who argued against NATO enlargement in the 90s are arguing that Ukraine properly belongs to Russia today. And they argue either that we must not humiliate Putin, in other words, the Ukrainians can't win even though they may, or that the Ukrainians can never win, it's impossible. In either case, Ukrainians in danger of winning, Ukrainians cannot win. The policy solution is always the same, give it to Moscow. 
as if the Ukrainians have no agency or identity. So what do we do about that now? Stop feeling guilty. You know, just stop. Recognize the Russian threat for what it is, and there's no me need to add to what Garry Kasparov and Andrzej Novak said. They described it, plus the historical roots, better than I could. I don't know how the war will turn out. Nobody does. Ukrainian victory is not guaranteed. Neither is Ukrainian defeat. There is an area of unknown. Ukraine may not have the power to regain the Crimea or every inch of the Donbass, but it could turn back the Russian attack. It could regain a lot of territory. The Russians could have trouble holding what they've, achieved, what they've grabbed. Or the Russians could continue to advance slowly and painfully. We don't know, nobody knows, and in fact, we have the ability, the collective West, to influence, not determine, but influence the outcome. And therefore, we have responsibility commensurate with that possibility. We have two principal levers. Military assistance now underway. There is a major military logistics operation that the United States is leading with Great Britain and Poland operating largely, though not exclusively, through Polish territory. It is an operation like the operation to provide weapons to Great Britain and arm the French resistance. You know, the an analogy isn't perfect because it's a conventional, real live war in Ukraine. We need to do more and faster. All right, I, I'm not here, and with, with Secretary Mattis in the audience, I'm not going to start talking about HIMARS or what more we could provide. But we need to do more. Secondly, sanctions. The sanctions in 2014 were better than nothing, but the ones now are a lot better than those. But they're not enough. Right now, the G7 is debating a, imposing a price cap on, on Russia's sale of oil, which is its principal export item. There are a lot of people, including some in this audience, who don't think that's practical. I don't know. But I do know that the Biden administration and G7 are taking it seriously, and they better take it seriously, because if you're trying to stop Putin, you have to go after the money. And you may have to accept a degree of risk. Nobody's tried anything like a price cap on oil. It has risks. But then again, I keep hearing the Ukrainians say, what the hell are you talking about? You, what risks are you taking compared to the ones we take every day? Our risk tolerance should rise with the emergency. There are other things we can do. We need to put the pressure on Russia now while political support in Europe and the United States remains high. We don't need to agonize about various negotiating scenarios, which always end up with some comfortable people in the West drawing lines on a map and disposing of other people. You know, and when we do that, let's just say that other people's citizens end up in boxcars traveling in the wrong direction, usually east. Enough. Right now, our duty is clear. Help the Ukrainians push the Russians. Now the empire is trying to come back. But let's not forget that democracies are not doomed. We are more resilient than our enemies think. We have more possibilities than we ourselves realize. And I'll end by quoting Abraham Lincoln. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, dare to do our duty as we understand it. There is no way the Ukrainians will believe that a ceasefire will mean an end to Putin's ambition, and we shouldn't fool ourselves either. We shouldn't fool ourselves either. We were too eager after 2014 and 2015 to accept that the conflict was contained and that the Minsk process could go on forever and we were wrong and everybody's, especially the Ukrainians, are paying the price for that mistake. 
if it comes to a ceasefire without justice, which is not what you're advocating and you hate the idea, but if it comes to that, then we will have a task of strengthening Ukraine and continuing to weaken Russia in anticipation of Putin trying to take the next move. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And we shouldn't be in a goddamned hurry to start coming up with diplomatic plans which always involve somebody else's concessions. We don't need to do that. Anybody in the United, anybody in the Biden administration who writes up a kind of a peace plan is doing a, 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 a political suicide note. And they shouldn't do it. And there's no need to do it. Concentrate on what we, on, on what we have to do right now. And then we'll figure out, hopefully we get peace with justice. And if not, that, that we'll deal with that. Anyway, that's a long answer, but that's a serious question. And that's the best shot, I, I, and, and I gave my best shot.